Good morning and welcome to Moments with Melinda. Today, I am so honored to have as my guest, Adam Hergenrother. Adam, how are you? It's a great day on planet Earth. I'm super excited to be here. And I just wanted to thank you for all the hard work and energy that you uh, do to put this show on to help inspire Vermonters. So thank you. I know how, how much work goes beyond the scenes to do this. So I just want to say thanks. Well, thank you, Adam. And um, I've always been a big fan of yours uh, for many, many years. But let me tell my viewers a little bit about you. Oh. Adam Hergenrother is the founder and CEO of Adam, Adam Hergenrother Companies. Adam is passionate about using business to transform lives and believes that when you focus on growing and leading yourself first, the business results will follow always. So, Adam... I think of you as a serial entrepreneur. You are young and tremendously successful, and you have turned to gold so many of your visions. So let us start at the beginning. Tell us the story of your youth and your challenges, which put the wind in your sails. Oh, that's a wonderful way of saying it. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's always kind of hard to hear people introduce you. It's, it's like a weird thing for it. I don't know. Um, well, I'll, I'll start back when, uh, when I was, I think it's pivotal, when I was 15 years old, um, so I was a freshman in high school, up until that point, I was 100 pounds overweight, I was failing classes, and I was doing drugs. I was really like that role model student that you wanted your friend, your kid to hang out with. Um, and one day, I, you know, it, it, it built up over the years, right, over, you know, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, right, going the freshman year. And finally, I came home one day, Melinda, and I just said, I, this is not what my life is going to be about. And it wasn't me saying it. It was a deeper voice that was back there. That was just kind of this intuition, this knowing that like, this is not what my life is supposed to be about. So I started crying and I stayed up all night. My dad was working nights that, 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 that time. And he came in at one o'clock. He's like, what are you doing up? And he could tell I was obviously distraught. And of course, being like the father he was, he kind of walked in and was like, well, he's like, you can do two things about it. So I was like, I'm upset about everything. He's like, you can do two things about it. He's like, you can accept it or you can change it. And he walked away. I was like, great. Like, thanks. Right. And, uh, and so he was right though. That's really what it was. And so in that moment, I kind of just stayed up and I used visualization at that point in time to kind of just start imagining what my life could be like. And it was a technique at the time that worked really effective for me. And, um, so I, I woke up and I stopped hanging out with all the kids that I was hanging out with. They ended up stealing everything from me. Police were ended up at the high school that I was at because they threatened to be beat me up every day for like two weeks and they moved on. I lost a hundred pounds in a year. Um, and fitness became really important to me, which is why we sponsor a lot of things with kids in fitness now, because it really helped change my life and provide grounding structure to it. Changed around my grades and uh, ended up going to UVM. Um, so that was kind of the first turning point. And, and I'll be a little brief on this, but in UVM, I'll tell you, there's a key point here. I was never academically the smartest person. Um, but I think I just worked harder than most people did to, in order to to achieve at whatever I needed to do at. Um, and so I, testing like that didn't come to me, but I always wanted to, to push myself. But there was a key moment in, uh, in UVM where I had a couple thousand dollars I'd saved up and I was working during college to pay for it uh, along with some student debt. And uh, a friend of mine who was like living in my dorm, but wasn't going to school there, right, um, was with me. And he said, hey, do you want to invest into this car with me? And, uh, and, and we can, it takes $500, we can buy it. I think we can make another $500 doing it. So I said, sure. But it was, the, it was really important for me for business because it was the first time that I took money and gave it to somebody else, never did anything with it, i.e. like this whole leverage component. And they bought the car, he flipped it, and we each made like $750. So I more than doubled my investment, right? Or not quite doubled it, but I more than like 125% of my investment, right? And so we started doing that. So I learned as a freshman in college, like this whole leverage component. And it was a wonderful way because then it kind of sparked me into... Um, I also learned about contracts because after about a year, he realized I don't need your money anymore to do this. I don't want to split this with you anymore. So since we started this business and I took that money and then bought a piece of real estate um, and that's kind of how it started of me getting into my real estate journey uh, along the way. There's one other key moment here that I'll, then I'll stop is when I, um, like some of you who are maybe listening to this, at least for me, I had put, I had made a change when I was 15. Then I started getting really addicted to money. Um, I started thinking that money was going to bring me the happiness, joy, enthusiasm, peace that I was looking for. So I set this financial goal of, hey, when you can make a half million dollars net income, like somehow this injection or this 
presence going to be sitting underneath the tree and like you're going to open it and you're going to all of a sudden feel the sustained feeling for the rest of your life. And so when I was about 27 years old, I hit that and I remember having, um, and like most entrepreneurs who kind of hit their goals, it was like, I kept kind of wanting to improve it, but then something changed with this one. And this was almost 10 years just a little over 10 years from where I had this other pivotal moment in my life when I was 15, this is when I was 27, that I, um, I said, you know, this is not what life's about either. It can't be about money. It can't be money is money, joy is joy. And I'm trying to link these two. And I, at the time, I couldn't say it as I could there, but I said, this is not what my life is about either. And so I actually, I didn't get depressed. That's not the right word, but I got kind of like, this path doesn't work right? It's not working for what I'm looking for. Because I think most people are waking up wanting to feel good about their lives. They want to wake up and feel good. And that's a choice. So I just said, this isn't working, thinking that I'm going to find my joy outside with something. So that's when I started this whole inward journey in my life about, let me go fix me and then bring me into whatever I'm doing. It's like, people always say like, I want to go find my passion. I go, well, why don't you just be passionate? And then you passionate about everything that you're doing. And so you're not limiting yourself to one thing or another, you're just enjoying what's your interaction with life. And so it's the interesting thing is when I actually started applying that in our business, they have exploded to 800 plus people in our world and 30 plus states. And so it's, it's actually, you end up getting kind of what you want. If you say, if, if you will, by not making it about you fixing yourself from the outside with this need for things or people or other events to occur that are unfolding the way you want it to. And that was a really pivotal moment that really put me on the journey to where I am today. Woof. Sorry. Awesome. <laughs> wow. I am just, yeah. you electrify me. Um, so who had the greatest impact on your success and on your life? Who's the person? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, there's a, my mentor um, in the business side is Gary Keller. He took me under the wing when I was about two, uh, in 2009. And uh, he was the first person I was really kind of getting in the business at the time, really starting to build actual business with other people and leaders. And that's a whole other world, right? It's like you do everything yourself. It's so bright or you start hiring people and then you get hard managing that. And then you get leaders trying to manage leaders is a whole other thing, right? It's like, you know that. So it just becomes this whole other animal. And so he really, he, um, who is I heard, he? Who is so he? He's, yeah, he's the owner of a company called Keller, KWX. It includes Keller Williams. It includes... Um, a whole real estate ho holdings. It's a mortgage company, title company, insurance company. So a lot of things, real estate. But what really excited me about him was the way he thought, which was um, I, I was told up to that point, like the way I was doing business wasn't really the right way to do it because nobody had ever done it really that way necessarily, or at least the people I had been around. And so he was the first person to say, no, that's exactly how you do it. You lead through people, you support people. You don't need to do it yourself, right? That whole, like, give people the opportunity, create a financial relationship so that they really succeed. And so you wake up every day, which is my philosophy, never having to worry about Melinda in business. Because in, if I create a relationship with Melinda that we both win, it's a win-win deal. I wake up every day thinking about how does, how, how does Melinda succeed? And so he really taught me that, which is really freeing. But the other thing with him is that he is very much an understanding in the way that I think that, that I am. And I know you believe a lot of this too, is that we're a spiritual being having a minor physical experience. And he really drilled that in early on about 15 years ago in my life. And that helped me in my inner journey, right? Of like, Hey, you're just, we're a spiritual being having this, this, physical experience here and there's all these wonderful things i mean as far as we know we hit the absolute jackpot on planets because you could go on mars and see some turtleback rocks that look like turtles and you can be in vermont and see the turtles right? it's like you can actually see them so so adam you have a podcast and your podcast is business meets spirituality and this is such a profound way and lovely way to approach capitalism yeah. Is this way? And so I wanted to let our folks know that you do have a podcast and share with us a little bit how that merging that for you has yeah. inspired you and made you a, a better person and a better leader. Thank you. Um, you know, it was really, it started as self of like a uh, personal therapy for myself, I think, because I struggled in the beginning of this kind of inward journey of me of um, asking the question, like, Hey, I don't want to go live in a cave. Um, but I don't want to make my money about, I don't want to make my life about money or getting something in business. I'm like, there's gotta be a way they coexist, right? Like there's, and there's just this massive question that was just in the back of my mind at all times. 
And so I really started teaching that and, and, you know, about a decade ago, um, we called it like limitless, which was really a course that was just about what we're talking about here today, about how do you use business as a conduit for your personal growth, which is because when you're in business, there's things that you, that you wouldn't sign up for, like having everyone quit in one day or trying to figure out how to make payroll or being sued or having majority of the public, not knowing who you are, but yet taking shots at you every other moment, right? Like, so there's all these things that are going on in business that gives you a chance to get rid of the part of you that is not okay with that. And that is real personal growth, right? That personal growth is, it's never the event that is bothering you, right? There's an event that happens outside, but you bother yourself about the event, right? And so how do you get rid of that part of you, which is the essence of kind of spirituality or personal growth, in my opinion, which is getting rid of that part so you can live untethered, which means that you can wake up knowing that there's going to be all these things that happen. You're going to lose money, make money, rattlesnakes, butterflies, all those things that are going to go on. They're different experiences, but you're just interacting with them. And so um, we started getting a pretty decent following and people asked me to kind of speak all over. And I didn't, I didn't really, I had three kids under 10, so I didn't want to really want to travel anymore. And so we created a podcast um, and uh, it's been a lot of fun and, and we kind of tackle a lot of these things in, in uh, each week. How do people so find it? How do people find your podcast? Yeah, thanks. On pretty much any of the, um, your favorite podcast player uh, will be on there and it's business meets spirituality. And, and, oh, but and they you, have to go to your, they have to go to your web, they have to go to your website, right? Do they go to your website to find it or? Yeah, they can go to adamhergenrother.com or okay, you perfect. can just go to, you know, Great. Apple, IT, yeah, whatever it is. Yep. And find you. And find so, us. so Adam, um, talk, talk to me a little bit about the top three, t- just three, the top three things that you believe uh, make a great leader. Top three. Yeah. Number one is that you approach every situation never wanting to be right, but always looking for the solution. In essence, you're dropping your ego, right? Number two, that you have a very good job of being able to cast a vision, which means that people want to understand where they're going, what that looks like, right? The vision of what, where the organization's going, how they pull themselves into all of that. Um, and then number three is providing absolute crystal clear clarity, which is what, where everybody's doing the actual mechanics of the how, which is so like the first thing is, is that I think it's, it could be vision clarity and then re- then making sure you approach situations, um, never wanting to, to be right. But if you don't have a vision, you don't know where you're going, then really nothing else matters. And the job as a leader is to be the one pointing the organization in the ship, right. And staying in that lane. People right now, more than any other time that I've seen in my lifetime, want engagement in community. And there is a loneliness epidemic of entrepreneurship right now because everybody has become an entrepreneur, but now they're lonely. So it's, it's actually spiraling this loneliness epidemic because people are now can go work from their house, which is wonderful. But now they've lost this community kind of touch feel that they used to get, which they probably didn't put as much energy into understanding that as they did before. And so it's how, as a leader, you have to be able to solve that problem of the vision of the clarity, which is culture, right? Of how you bring all that together, the mechanics of your organization. And remember, culture is not ping pong parties and, and you know, pizza, right? A culture is how people act every day. Or right? how people it's feel. How they feel. How That's ex- feel. exactly right. One of the, one of the sayings we, we have here, which is, you know, be the reason why Melinda wants to show up for work today. And if everybody showed up that way, you're creating that. Whether you're doing it over a Zoom or you're meeting in person, be the reason why that is. So for a leader, if you don't know where you're going and you can't provide the clarity, it's very difficult to get people to actually join the mission, which is what people are engaged to at this point in time. Well, you have, you have, you have raised a lot of ships in your, in your day. Um, can you talk about your book? The Founder and the Force Multiplier, which focuses on building strategic partnerships between entrepreneurs and their executive assistants. I got my start as an executive assistant. I didn't know that. Back then, then we were called secretaries. I'm a kid girl. And I grew my life in the same way that you're speaking over the the years. But I started that way. And I was so thrilled to see this when I was researching you, that you're focusing on this because many, many of these, of these human beings are women yes. and they need to be lifted up and given opportunity. And I was so honored and to, delighted to see that you wrote a book and that you really care about this. You want yeah. to share a little bit about it with us, Adam? Love to, love to, yeah. Um, we, uh, so 
Hallie, my chief of staff now, who was my EA for a while, she'd been with me for 13 years, so a long part of my journey. Um, and we, uh, we got into it and we just started creating a relationship. And then, you know, what's really interesting is after about five years into this, we started building these companies and doing it. And she was really a, a partner and we didn't know any different because I just treated her as like, she literally was a partner of mine. And then we realized that that's not how most, or that's not how people really treated their executive assistants. Um, that's not how the executive system was seeing it, but yet we were seeing that this whole thing. So our books started kind of what started off as a blog. We wrote a blog together about this. And honestly, it was in, in one day, we had like four or 5,000 people read it. And so we were like, huh, that's interesting. Was it the timing? Was it like, what do we write? So we paused. And then three months later, we wrote another blog about our relationship and the same thing happened. And it went, it went nationwide or international, like people from all over. So then we were like, okay. So then we wrote the book as to kind of create this movement of understanding that your right hand force multiplier, the person that's next to you is a true strategic business partner with you. And they're just doing, dip. it's like, I always look at this as like Hallie and I, or even Kim, who's our EA, we're all force multipliers. We're all doing the same job, just different parts of it. And it's never, and it's that trusting relationship. So it's like, I'm really good at taking something from like a zero to a one <laughs> and then having Hallie take it or Kim take it from like a, a two to a nine and then giving it back to me at a 10, right? Like that's just where I, where I go. And so you need somebody to be able to work on the same components that you're working on um, as a true partner. And so we, we created that relationship and a framework for how people can, uh, can create this strategic partnership. You know, if you think about the president of the United States, any president, right. They have a chief of staff, the chief of staff actually as a, as a, as in the oval office actually has more power than like the, the vice president, right. Or a lot of other people there. And so that chief of staff in business is such an important person. The EA is such an important person in your world. And I think, people need to move, uh, understand that and start moving to, to that world of giving that opportunity to the people that are the right hand per. Um, well, Adam, it's also, Adam, it's also empowering women. I mean, you're empowering women. You have, yeah. I believe do you have three daughters. I have two daughters and a son. And a son. Okay. You know, and, our, you know, it's funny. Well, no, when you say that over 70% of our work that our employees are women. Well, I know, I know that. Yeah. And, and you, and, and I honor you in that because you've always been a man. Yeah. <laughs> who, who who looks out for and supports and elevates women yeah. in their in their leadership roles and I and I and I honor you on that. So the book is called The Founder and the Force Multiplier. And for any CEO or entrepreneur, I suggest that you order the book and you learn how to elevate uh, your second, third in command to have leadership roles and to be valued by you because oftentimes that is not the case. So Adam, can you tell us a bit about your project you? which is a, and it's project you with the letter U, which is a training program that you offer to help folks to be great leaders. Yeah. Thank you. You know, we're going to talk about all this stuff. It's great. Uh, the, yeah. Project you came about similar to um, where the podcast came in is, is I was being asked to kind of go around the country and I just chose not to want to travel anymore uh, or do one-on-one -on -one coaching. And so I, uh, I created this, this group called project you, we limited to 25 leaders across the country. We had, actually, we had people from Alaska to France fly in and it's a year long immersion. Cause what I found when I was training for a day or two, people would be like, wow, this is amazing. Adam, you're the best thing ever. And then I'd see them in six months and they'd be like, I'm so excited to see you again. I'm like, well, did you actually make any change? And they go, well, no, but like, I can't wait to be here today. And I'm, I'm here ready to do this. So I was like, and some people did, don't get me wrong. Right. But um, the majority of it is they just, there wasn't the accountability. So I wanted to, to create a program where you can't escape from that. So when you sign up, you're with us for a year, you get coaches, you get um, uh, accountability. There's four in-person meetings a year that are three days long that create this incredible group. And we really focus on four important factors that I think um, really create a human, right? Which is your health, right? That's the first component. And health isn't just about like running an Ironman, right? Health is about how do I feel? kind of physical energy do I have, right? What do I eat? How do I sleep? What does that look like? The, all, we do hair DNA testing to make sure people are eating properly. So all that, we really dive deep into that. Then we get into wealth, which is not, it is a component about how do you extract additional profit from your organization mechanically, but it's more importantly, Melinda, it's about what is money? Like what does actually wealth mean? I don't know if you saw this, but this is fascinating because we pay attention a lot to it. There's a stat that came out this year that, um, which has been there for a while, but it said, uh, there's two components to it is that people's happiness or joy doesn't increase after about $70,000. But what they found out, which I haven't seen before is 
after $250,000 in that income, it actually goes down because luxury becomes a light, a necessity. And then people feel the pressure of the luxury necessities that they have to support. So they're really interesting that like does that. So we understand like, what is wealth? What does that look like? The third um, section of it is all about spirituality, personal growth, right? What does that really mean? What does that look like? We really go and really go deep into that. And each time we get into these programs, they have to practice something from each one, the entire course. And the last one is leadership and relationships, um, which is really about um, what does a conscious relationship look like? What does it mean to be mindful in your relationship? Like I hear the word, like, but when rubber hits the road, what does it actually mean? How do I do it? How do I practice that? How do I get better at it? So we really teach people the techniques and go deep into that. So at the end of it, Melinda, at the end of it, the, the person that they really worked on the project was themselves. Here, 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 here. Yeah. Uh, Adam, so can you tell us a little bit about Hallie Warner and her online seminar? And this is, by the way, folks, this is everything that you can find at adamhergenrother.com, right? That's your website. Um, and everything we're talking about today, you can go to Adam's website and, and find out more about this. But Hallie Warner has an online seminar that helps executive assist assistants move into leadership and high demanding positions. You want to talk a few minutes about that? Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, again, Hallie's uh, passion is that for that movement of creating, because she was an EA and was that same pigeonholed thing. And she's like, no, 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 I'm a business partner, right? I'm like, doing I'm, the work. And also, yes. I'm, hey, by the way, I'm doing the work and you're getting the credit. Exactly. See how it plays out. 100%. And by the way, you're getting the money. I'm getting, you know, I mean, when I started, started out, I was getting, you know, one hundredth what the executives were getting, but I was literally doing all the work and the reports. So this is really so. This so inspires me. So continue yeah. on, my friend. Yeah. And but by the way, I mean, you know, and Hallie, it was a great thing about this. Hallie owns equity in almost every business that I own, right? Bravo. Because I treated Bravo. her as an partner. Good for you. Good all for that. Her. Um, yeah, she's wonderful. She deserves it, right? Well, I mean, she should absolutely. Yeah. So again, she's just, it's, it's mechanically like, you know, so she really kind of walks people through the seminar of like how to actually show up, how to actually insert yourself, how to have the confidence to do it, how to, you know, how to align yourself with the right founder or leader that is actually what you're looking for. And so she was going to take you through that whole process. And, you know, there's international people all over the place um, that come in for these webinars, which we're super excited for. It kind of walks you through step-by-step step on what the book is in the republishing. By the way, with the book, we are, um, we are, uh, we've created a second edition to it because a lot of things have changed um, with different insights to it that's actually going to be coming out later this year so we're super excited for that cool. but we, we, she does a lot of these webinars and other uh webinars throughout the year they're all free by the way for the most part oh, so, they're all free yeah, yeah. And, and and the whole thing about empowering oneself know your value and, and oftentimes when women try to do that um they are suppressed yes and you have to be able to speak up and know your know your power kick the door down and i'll be yeah. talking about this next week by the way awesome um so I also want to ask you about, um, about what your most important socially responsible business practices are. And I also want to, to, to get an idea from you about where you see the future of our, our world today in the, in the mire of, yeah. of uh, things that we're dealing with as a society and as a planet. Yeah, yeah. let me, I'll tell you that, that part because that's a, has been, I think right now, you know, it's funny because there's so many metrics that consume, Americans actually have more money on average than they have any time in their life, yet people are feeling more depressed, more lonely. There's more attempted suicides between, you know, ages 10 and 18 than any other time in history yet, you know, pre uh, teenage sex is down, drinking's down, smoking's down. So it's like, it's almost like a lot of the metrics that we wanted to track are down, but yet the, the most important metrics are up. So what is it, right? Like, what is the cause of all of that? I think a lot of this has to do with with the, the lack of engagement um, with individuals, like actually being conscious with them, meaning that you're actually there with somebody. People are naturally feeling this. So I think one of the socially responsible things that I think you can do as a business owner is number one, be a conscious business. Because if you're a conscious business, you're taking all of that, and we can do the actual mechanical things you can do with that way. But if you if you are a conscious organization and you treat and you teach people how to be more conscious human beings, they bring that back down into their families. They bring that back down to their colleagues, to your clients, to their vendors that you work with. So the most important thing that we do is we actually train people the heart of our organization. I always say like, we're actually really a training company that disguises us as a business, right? Um, that we really are just pouring into the personal development of individuals so that they become a better, more um, conscious human to experience life deeper and give that out there all through while we're doing business. I think that um, if our world 
in general doesn't start re-engaging around that, there will be continue uh, fallout from people feeling isolated yet around everybody. <laughs> and I think that's where, where we're kind of at right now. And people are on edge of everything, right? So it doesn't even matter what it is, inflation, they're going to blame everybody. And this happens over here. So the, it's, it's like there needs to be in business where we partner with, with, with businesses, we acquire them. And one of the biggest things that we're seeing right now, Melinda, is that people, it's kind of like solving the loneliness epidemic of entrepreneurs. I think I said that earlier, people are lonely, even though they're making money, they're around people, they're looking for this, this engagement. And I think a culture who acts that way, um, who's allowing people to be authentic, right, is allowing people to show up and contribute. And here's the other point. One thing you can do as a business is celebrate meaningful wins for every individual. Because meaningful to me is different than meaningful Melinda. And so we have these written down kind of formulas that we use and really, and I don't say just write them down and put them on a wall. We actually do them, um, but as a way for new employees to come in and understand that, but celebrate everybody's meaningful win is the smallest thing that somebody does to the largest thing that somebody does. Um, celebrate those things and then allow people to be them. I think people are yearning to be themselves and show up. And authenticity isn't about calling somebody out. Authenticity is about you being able to express the highest point of this physical manifestation that you're in the business. So, Adam, why, why, why is there, why are people not um, accepting jobs? Why, why is there so much, uh, uh, so many ads? I seven days has like you know five thousand ads for for jobs. Why are people not taking jobs? Why are, why are businesses struggling? I bet you you're not struggling to find employees. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah I think, I think um, th there's two open positions for every unemployed person right now. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? It uh, is. It is. So what does I, Adam Hergen Rother have to say about that? <laughs> I think uh, it's not that people don't want to work. I think there's a segment of that. And I think there's always been a segment of people who don't want to work. I think really what it is, is they don't want to work for you. <laughs> That's right, because they're not being treated well, and they finally put their foot down and said, "Look, I'm 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 not going to do this anymore." That's exactly uh, right. And I think and I think as business, we are, we we are we we have to step it up and start paying people a livable wage yes. and passing laws that give us yes. um all, all the all the services that human beings need to to be able to work and have a family or have joy in their life, which you speak about. Um, so hopefully Vermont is is one of those places. Well, Adam Hergenrother, I'm going to go so I can see you here. I want to see you in my in my in my view. I want to see both of us right here. There you are. Hello, hello. Oh. So we're coming to the end of my show, and I have to say goodbye to you. But I want you to know from the bottom of my heart that you're one of the most fascinating people mm -hmm. um, that I've met. Um, I admire you so deeply, and the work that you've done, and the lives that you've helped, and um, and your role in this state and in this world. So Adam, thank you for your time. And to my viewers, please go to adamhergenrother.com, learn more about Adam's work. And um, is there any last words you'd like to say to my viewers, Adam? Well, I just wanted to thank you for all that you do again and, and I really appreciate being on here. If there's any first step that people can do is just to go out there and ask yourself each morning, how do I wanna feel? And you wanna feel great. And so just go act great. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna say goodbye to my viewers, and um, and thank you for being with us, and I will see you shortly. Goodbye.